hear me? Okay. So for whoever is editing the uh, video right now, uh, this was supposed to start at 5 o'clock. I believe that the keynote speech is going a little bit long. So rather than go ahead and launch into the presentation with nobody in the room right now, I'll go ahead and wait 15 minutes. If nobody's shown up in 15 minutes, I'll go ahead and do the presentation so that other people can go ahead and see the recording. Can you hear anything? Yeah. Good. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> to reiterate, we're going to run this like a res regular presentation. I'll go through the slides. I'll go through them fairly quickly, and then we'll throw the floor open, and we'll have the birds of a feather 
discussion, anything we want to go ahead and talk about related to this, if everybody's okay with that. So. We'll wait just a few minutes because obviously people are coming back from the um, uh, uh, keynote. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed the end of the keynote. I get down here to get everything set up and whatnot. I, I really like that presentation. I don't know how other people feel and hear about it, but I thought he was spot on. <laughs> and that word would be? <laughs> I like Cory Doctorow. <laughs> uh, come on in. Don't just stand there looking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get started here in just a moment. Okay. So... <coughs> I think everybody I see here was at the presentation earlier where we talked about Gary Larson and how you build infinitely scalable high performance systems. And I went through three of the four elements. The actor model, using queues, pull things out of queues rather than pushing things to your servers. And the fourth thing, which I didn't have time to go ahead and talk about, was unikernels and virtual machines. Okay. Why do we need them? Well, because I, as I said, the actor model, you're only doing one thing, one function inside the actor. So that means in order to build a relatively sophisticated business application, you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of actors. If each one of them is running in a virtual machine, well, first of all, if they're all running on the same machine, then you've got the possibility of one actor bringing down another actor. You want the sort of isolation that you get from a virtual machine. Well, even using virtual machines, there are limits, uh, and some I saw on the order of like about 300 virtual machines per physical server for uh, vSphere. Um, you've got a lot of physical servers out there, and since the actor's only doing one thing, if you've got 300 on one big server that's got 56 core, something like that, you're wasting a hell of a lot of processing power. Okay, so what you go ahead and do is you go ahead and you shrink things down with a unikernel, and I'll get into that, and then you go ahead and you run it on very fast, very lightweight virtual machines, and Amazon has come up with several recently that we can go ahead and use, plus the traditionals of KVM and Zen. And, uh, um, um, Zen. Thank you there. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and really put a large number of actors, a large number of unikernels, a large number of virtual machines on one physical server. We're talking on the order of about 10,000 virtual machines running on one physical server, each one of those virtual machines servicing one actor. So earlier today, I described it as a super container, a uh, unikernel as a super container. And I said, what else would you go ahead and call something that's 1,400 times more secure than your most secure Docker container? It boots 37 times faster than a Docker container runs 10 times more microservices on the same physical hardware. Actually, it's, it's a larger number than that. And you can go ahead and manage it with your no normal management tools. OK. Going to the punchline there, it's a unikernel image running on a lightweight virtual machine. OK, what's a unikernel? OK, to answer the question, let's go ahead and take a look at what an operating system is. And I don't care whether it's Microsoft or Linux, Unix, whatever Apple's calling their operating system this particular week, they all have basically the same physical structure. Here at the very center is the kernel. And then all of this around it is what we call the user land. Those are all the applications that run on top of the kernel. So this is, you know, the, the shell commands. This is, you know, copy. Uh, remove, make directory, as well as more sophisticated applications that are part of your general distribution that do observability and things like that. So you have the kernel, you have the user land. Okay, the kernels 
have gotten out of hand. There are 20 million lines of code in the Linux kernel. Now, this slide's a little bit old. This was, this, I put this together just before COVID hit. So this is, you know, since, since COVID, and we know there have been a number of releases that Linus has gone ahead and done during that time period. So it's probably almost double the number of lines of code. Uh, I won't go quite that far, but it's above 22 million now. Windows is estimated at 50 million lines of code. Okay, Steve McConnell at Microsoft has gone ahead and done a study of defects in kernels. And he says that on the average, there are 15 to 50 defects per thousand lines of code. So what that means is the Linux kernel has got any place from 330,000 to 1.1 million defects. Windows, 750,000 to 2.5 million defects. I always thought that Windows was worse than Linux, but now I've got mathematical proof. <laughs> okay, so and that's just the kernel. It gets worse from there. When we talk about the user land, and we have to have some applications around it, the best you can possibly do is something like Alpine that uses BusyBox, but BusyBox is a fairly large application in and of itself, so it's got a large number of errors. But for the most part, you go ahead and you use that user land, um, there, the user land is 10 to 20 times larger than the kernel. So for RHEL, and this was probably RHEL 7, um, there are approximately 420 million lines of code in the user, user land area. So that is 6.3 to 21 million defects running on your bank's server. Can it get worse? Of course it can. The kernel is full of junk. There are a large number of device drivers that are routinely compiled into the kernel that are no longer used. Um, Amazon AMI images no longer have floppy disk drivers and audio card drivers, but they did in 2015. The Venom vulnerability went ahead and used the floppy disk controller driver inside the AMD kernel. The, the AMI kernel, rather, I'm sorry. And that's not all. It gets even worse. There are thousands of storage and communications protocols, again, that are routinely compiled into the kernel that are not used. Linux recognizes seven different executable formats, although the majority of, them of, of all applications are using ELF. Okay, so each of those unused lines of code, or I'm sorry, unused chunks of code throws in another 15 to 50 defects per thousand lines of, of uh, source code. Okay, so the obvious is let's cut it out. You can compile kernels, you can do special compilation of kernels, you can leave out those device drivers, you can leave out those communications protocols that aren't being used if you know the kernel inside and out. Um, otherwise, you're going to go ahead and cut out something that's going to keep it from compiling or keep it from operating, or you're going to go ahead and miss things. N I don't know that many people that are such kernel experts that they could go ahead and do that. But that still doesn't go ahead and get rid of all the problem because studies show that of the kernel, your path of your application on average only touches 0.08% of the code that's in the kernel. So even if you pare it down to just the code that really should be in the kernel, chances are your application is not going to use most of that code. So you've got a lot of buggy code that's sitting, or a lot of buggy kernel and user land that's sitting out there that really does nothing for your application, but it certainly goes ahead and takes up a lot of space, slows up processing, uses up memory, and increases your vulnerability. So let's just go ahead and cut it out. Now, uh, earlier today, somebody asked about how you go about cutting out the code. And one of the things that, that we talked about was the fact that the C compiler already goes ahead and does unused code elimination. So you want to do something like that for the kernel. If you could compile your application and have the compiler say, these are the parts of the kernel that are no longer necessary. Let me go ahead and, and leave them out. That would go ahead and get you to where you want to be. Okay. Now, what do we need for our applications of that kernel, of that 
22 million lines of code, what do we really go ahead and use? Or wh what do we need to have be there? Okay, so we're talking about the actor model. This is all in the context of how you build infinitely scalable, high-performance systems using Gary Larson's technique of pull, don't push. Okay, so you have got one application running. It is single user. You know what drivers you're going to go ahead and use. It's not like somebody's going to plug in something that you don't know about. That's not part of your business process. You have maybe one or two communications protocols. If we go ahead and pare it down to just those, then of course you go ahead and get, I'm sorry, we want, no. And again, I apologize. I was not really prepared to give this presentation today, so I haven't done a lot of practice on it. But what we need is we need reliability for our actors. We need security. And finally, we need repeatability because we're going to have many, many, many copies of the actors out there. So that really only exercises a very small amount of the kernel. The kernel is multi-process, multi-user, and we're going to throw all of that away. Okay. So what do we get? We get increased security. We get a reduced attack surface. And it's small enough that we could possibly mathematically verify. That's the, one of the big problems right now is that virtually all of our kernels operating systems applications are far too large to actually go ahead and mathematically prove correct. They did it with the L4 kernel in a particular application or a particular configuration a number of years ago and the L4 kernel is much much smaller than the, the, uh, the current Linux kernel. Um, okay and then if we take away all the user land, if we take away the shell there's nothing for a hacker to go ahead. Even if they manage to get in, there's nothing for them to do. All there is is a running application. There's no way that they can affect it because they didn't have any tools in there. We, don't, we didn't leave them any tools in there. Okay, we statically link everything together. We've got an immutable binary. There are no modules. There are no dynamic libraries that can be added. Code can't be injected. We are in a very, very secure situation, a very reliable situation. Big performance gains. The average unikernel with an application would be on the order, with an actor application would be on the order of five megabytes per virtual machine, which means that we can go ahead and run 10,000 virtual machines on a hardware server. The virtual machines boot up in about six milliseconds. Uh, regular process boots in one millisecond. Um, so you were on, we're, we're in the ballpark of a regular process. Um, but then once we're actually running, we get tremendous performance benefits by virtue of the fact that we're not having to transition back and forth between ring zero, which is the kernel, and ring four, which is the, the user operate, you know, the, the user space. So normally every time you make a system call, the machine goes ahead and puts everything on the stack aside, creates a new stack for the kernel, allows the kernel to go ahead and run. Then after those results are there, then of course it has to go back and redo the, the, the moving the stack over and putting the original stack back. And all that takes a lot of time. Okay, there was one group that created a unikernel to do DNS resolution. Okay, so, you know, DNS, everybody here familiar with DNS? Yeah, so you send a, you send a request to the DNS server, the DNS server looks it up and sends, you, sends it back to you. And of course, it's all done um, as, as quickly as possible because you do a DNS lookup for virtually everything that you're going to go ahead and do. What they did was they went ahead and they created a unikernel and a virtual machine that would sit there listening for the request. Or actually, there, there are two virtual machines. One virtual machine was listening for the request. And as soon as the request came in, then it launched the second virtual machine with the DNS application in the unikernel. It would then go ahead and satisfy the request, and then they would blow away that virtual machine. So basically, every time a DNS request came in, um, you created a whole new virtual machine and a, a, an application to go ahead and answer it and then go ahead and throw it away. Just as a research project, they went ahead and did that. They were getting 45 microsecond response times uh, to the DNS requests. Okay. 
So how do we include only the code that we need? Uh, the C library is a good example again. Um, how, who here has made a system call? Really? Did you load the correct code into the register? Did you do the correct interrupt? Mm, probably not. Maybe you did, but you don't do it on a routine basis. Okay, you did it in school. Okay, okay. But for the most part, when we go ahead and do a system call, what we do is we tell C that we want to go ahead and do something. It sets up the system call for us. So what happens if we said, don't set up the system call for us. Actually go ahead and do what the kernel would have done, us, done for us under that system call. So now at this point, we have a special C library that we can link against. And then it'll throw away those portions of the C library that we don't use. And now we're down to just the things that we need out of the kernel. That's one possible approach. And that's why, in fact, it's called a library operator. Another word for a unikernel, another uh, term quite often used, is a library operating system. Because basically, you're using the C library as the basis for getting rid of the kernel, but keeping all the kernel functionality. OK, so in the real world, we have the current world, we have configuration files. Then you've got the application. Then you've got the, the runtime, whether that's Python or C. Um, then you've got kernel threads that are here. Now you're going to go ahead and do, every time you're, you're making a uh, system call, you're going to transition this boundary, and that's going to cost you a lot of time. Then the kernel, uh, uh, you have user processes over here. Then you've got the file system, and then you've got your network stack. What the unikernel compiler does is it reduces it just down to the application code and those portions of the operating system that you're really using. They're all running in ring zero so that there's no delay between application code and the equivalent functionality. Where over here you've got the kernel running in ring zero and the application running in ring three and you've got that uh, barrier. As you, every time you transition the barrier, you've got quite a, uh, a performance hit. Now, I say quite a performance hit. This is the performance hit we live with every day. We don't even think about it. So think about how much faster it would be if you didn't have what you already know, don't even consider to be a delay. I think. OK. <coughs> uh, OK, I'm going to go through this one fairly f <coughs> quickly. Let me suffice it. OK, everybody here is familiar with virtual machines. <coughs> okay, so you've got commercial products like vSphere. You've got that, that built into the Unix kernel, things like KVM. You've also got Zen, which is another. I actually, I think most of the Zen uh, drivers are built into Linux, so you can run Zen fairly easily from Linux. Um, they, okay, one of the things that they do is that they emulate the hardware. Your application thinks it's running on its own hardware because the virtual machine emulates a server. So it emulates the BIOS or, or uh, um, EHI or EH, what is it? UEFI, right, thank you. Um, it emulates memory. It emulates the network stack. Um, so your application thinks it's running on a real piece of hardware. And most of that's QEMU in the case of KVM or Zen. That's an awful lot of code that's running that we don't need because we know exactly what part of the network stack we need and we're not including anything that's not actually part of our application or part of the code that we really need to use out of the kernel. So we don't need to simulate a piece of hardware. So we throw away all the QEMU stuff out of the virtual machine. That goes ahead and lightens it up a tremendous amount. Also, <coughs> And this is really strange, and I didn't believe it when I first went ahead and investigated it. But <sighs> things like Zen were, were put together sort of um, uh, haphazard. Uh, the way that the virtual machine talks to the controlling hypervisor in Zen really is like two people talking to each other or talking and talking and talking until they happen to, to, to 
hear each other. The way that it goes ahead, the virtual machine will go down a whole list of channels at the very same time the hypervisor is listening to another series of channels and only when the two of them meet up will they actually be able to transmit the command. That was fine for Zen when they first did it as a development operating system. They've never really had a reason to go ahead and change up until now, up until things like unikernels being able to take advantage of the virtual machines if the virtual machines are smaller and more efficient. So one of the things that NEC has gone ahead and done, at least with the Zen virtual machine, is that they've gone ahead and they've removed that channel hopping type of a thing. And right now it is direct for the virtual machine to talk to the hypervisor and back and forth. That has gone ahead and sped up the performance two or three times and it has gone ahead and reduced the size of the code and it's reduced the size of the time that it takes to boot up because the virtual machine no longer has to go ahead and pass information back and forth to the hypervisor only after they match up in the kernel, uh, match up in the, uh, the channels. Okay, I'm gonna hop through these. This talks an awful lot about Docker here. Uh, okay, um, the new Unicorn, uh, the new VMs can b launch Unikernel. I'm sorry, launch. Well, yeah, launch Unikernels in as little as four milliseconds. Um, a regular process fork is one millisecond. So, like I say, again, we're still in the the same ballpark. A Docker container startup time is on the order of 150 milliseconds. So we are significantly faster than launching a Docker container. And we have the added security that we're in a virtual machine as opposed to the Docker container, which is very well locked down between SE Linux and AP, um, um, AP Armor um, and the other things that have been done with the OCI in order to make it more secure. The containers are still very secure, but there are exploits found routinely where they go ahead and they hop out of the container. And now, fortunately, we no longer have to run the containers as root. It used to be you had to run the container as root. So once you hopped out of the container, then you had the access to the entire server. That's not quite the same case anymore. But once you hop out of the container, then you've got a lot more flexibility of how you attack the rest of the machine. We're running each one of these unikernels in a separate virtual machine significantly more difficult to hop out of, significantly more isolation between. Well, because part of it, I, I see you're looking at this saying, well, maybe that's not true, maybe, yeah. Well, what it is is, remember, we've, a lot, we've eliminated portions of the virtual machine. We've eliminated all the Q, EMU stuff, so none of that can go ahead and, and uh, give you an, um, an exit strategy out of the virtual machine. And then, of course, we've gone ahead and tightened up the code with things like the channel hopping so that, uh, again, um, the, code, uh, the code is uh, a little bit tighter. So <coughs> I don't know. I haven't tried to escape the virtual machine. I'm going based on what the studies say. Okay. Uh, requires one-tenth of the Docker memory. Okay. <coughs> So here's some of the, the, sorry, some of the physical proof. So what they did was they started launching Docker containers every four milliseconds, and they started launching unikernels, uh, virtual machines holding unikernels uh, every four milliseconds. And as you can see, um, the time to start each one of the Docker containers is getting longer and longer as the machine is getting more and more burdened and more and more memory is being used. It tops out at about 3,000 Docker containers could be run on this particular machine. It couldn't run more because basically it just ran out of, of processing power. Uh, well, with our VMs and our unikernels, it kept right on going. We finally, they, the researchers got memory exhaustion on that particular server, which had 128 gig of memory uh, at 8,000. So, can you imagine the economics for Amazon if they went from 300 virtual machines per server to 10,000 to 100,000 virtual machines per server? Maybe they could go ahead and just have one server per data center. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, here is a list of some of the more common unikernel construction uh, tools. Uh, there was, again, there was a discussion earlier today about, well, it's just not that easy to go ahead and create a unikernel. It depends on what you're doing. If you're creating a new piece of code from scratch and you know that you're running in the unikernel, you know not to do multiprocessing, you're going to go, you're going to be using threads, number of things you know that you don't want to go ahead and do, which makes it a lot easier than to go ahead and compile it in the, the unikernel compiler. Now, if you're taking a piece of existing code, and I've had to do this just recently, take uh, a multiprocessing code and rewrite it so that it'll run correctly in a unikernel, that's difficult. There's no question about it. So with these tools, I will submit that if you've got, if you've written your code specifically to be threaded as opposed to multiprocessed, and you're aware of the fact that you're going to be in a unikernel environment, that using each one of these tools is really no more than running the GCC compiler against your code. It will go ahead and it will generate the unikernel for you. You can then go ahead and package that unikernel with any number of virtual machines, the Zen, KVM, um, and, and a couple of the other new, newer lightweight virtual machines and derive the results that I've gone ahead and just shown you. And as you can see, everybody's got their own favorite language in which they want to go ahead and write their unikernel. I think the first was uh, Mirage with uh, oh. was uh, Mirage here with OCaml. Um, anybody here familiar with OCaml? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. <laughs> You've heard of it. You know that it's a, um, a, a strongly typed functional language. Um, and yeah, it's supposed to be extremely uh, error-free. Uh, that's why they chose it for the unikernel. Um, I'll believe them. So, oh yeah, what happens if you're doing an IoT device? Well, you've got now. You've got just the you just your code, just the little bit of kernel that you need and actually did in order to make that code run. So obviously your batteries are going to last a lot longer and physically you can get smaller because you need less memory to go ahead and package it all into. So this becomes huge when you're in this type of a situation. Okay. As I said, you can go ahead and uh, run with uh, existing tools. Okay. Um, what are the drawbacks? Unikernels and light VMs is a new paradigm. There's a lack of experience. The limited selection of build tools. Uh, existing applications will require modifications. Um, and it may be difficult to develop and debug. Well, it's do d difficult to develop, I'm sorry, it's difficult to debug because you can't attach to the running process. We're used to going ahead and attaching to a running process and being able to see what's going on inside it. You can't do that with the unikernel. There's nothing to go ahead and attach to. Yes? Uh, probably not. Probably not, um, because you've stripped out everything other than what you actually require in order to run the application. So I don't think running it under QEMU is really going to buy you anything. You've already structured, you've already cut everything away such that QEMU is out there to emulate the machine, but the code that it's running has, has had stripped out of it everything that you would normally use to attach to debug. That's my feeling. I haven't actually gone ahead and tried that. Um, for the most part, my debugging consists of the old <coughs> K print, you know, print the results, or print, you know, print the, 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 mer the message, figure out where else the code may be going wrong, do another print statement, that type of a thing. Okay. Okay, just like I did this morning, here's a list of resources uh, if you want to go ahead and investigate further. Um, now, this slide deck is not currently up on our website. I told you earlier today that the slide deck that I used this morning was up on our website. I know several people have already gone ahead and downloaded it. This is not on our website right now. It will be on our website tonight so that you can go ahead and download this tomorrow. 
And uh, there's the website. Okay. So at this point, <coughs> I'm going to sit down and we're just going to talk. Uh, I guess we should probably use the microphone if we're going to be able to. So do you do you use Linux uh, to rebuild the kernel, or, or do you rebuild the Linux kernel, or are you building a, a completely different kernel when you're doing this? Oh, it's it's the Unix kernel. Um, okay. Well, I mean, because you know, really, sort of like, what are our choices? Microsoft, we don't have access to. Apple, we we don't have full access to. We've got bits and pieces of it. Uh, Linux is all there. Unix is the other example. Uh, some of these uh, Unix kernels are based off stripping down the the, uh, the Unix kernel and the Unix uh, user land. Uh, but other than that, I suppose yeah, you could go ahead and develop a Unix kernel using like L4 or something like that. Well, I, I I, seen it. when I came in, y'all were talking about Minix and Xenu and and uh, other kernels. Yeah, you probably just keep that off. Um. Oh, uh, yeah, um, the, the young lady here in the, the front row was talking about uh, uh, in college uh, having worked with a, a micro operating system. Yeah. So are, are any of those applicable? Uh, or are you are just saying it doesn't really matter which of those you choose? Right, it, it wouldn't. So, yeah, I guess actually, you know, Minix or what was the one you were using? Xenu? They might be bases. So. But doing, you've got to go ahead and write the code that goes ahead and strips out those portions of the kernel um, and, and then uh, compiles it all together. That's, that's up for you to go ahead and do. I personally am going to go ahead and use one of the toolkits that's already out there. They do use Linux. Well, I'm sorry. Several of them use Unix. The others use Linux. So, so basically it's an embedded system. Yes. Right. Yep. So it's same same techniques for an embedded system would be applied to this. So you could actually write bare bare metal. You could actually do do it in DOS. DOS is the the it's sort of like the original unikernel. It did right. one thing, and you had no separation between the kernel and the application. So DOS is a perfect example. It's it's not an embedded system as we normally think of because that embedded system that we normally think of is running with a full kernel. But yes, it's basically an embedded system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so this seems like the most amazing hammer, and I'm just wondering, like, have you even been able to nail anything with this? Like, have you been able to use it for anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and again, had I prepared this as a, a, a real talk to be given here, um, there's a demo that goes along with it. I've got a virtual machine that I can then go ahead and run smaller virtual machines within it. I can go ahead and do a compilation. Um, but again, as it came out in the discussion earlier today, somebody said, well, a hello world is easy enough. Well, that's actually what the demo was, is the hello world. Um, so I could go ahead and show you how quickly it can be done on something simple like that. But actually, I talked about having recently ported some code over from multiprocessing to run under the unikernel. That was a research project, a uh, fairly complicated research project that's being done by the Department of Energy. Um, the concern is that if anybody goes ahead and hacks into the power grid, all of the equipment on the power grid is all made by the same set of manufacturers. They all use the same set of code. If you crack the GE code, then you can go ahead and get into any GE system in the, the, the world type of a thing. So the research project involved a couple of different techniques. One was to go ahead and use the unikernel so that you couldn't get into it to crack it in the first place. The other thing that they were trying and, and using successfully, um, <laughs> we normally try, we strive for repeatability. When you compile something, you want it to produce the very same executable every time. You want to be able to actually even go ahead and, and hash that 
executable and get the very same hash every time. Well, there's a group out at Berkeley that has written a compiler that every time you run it, it randomly changes around how it sets up the subroutine map and a couple of other things. So they guarantee every time you compile, you will get the program that will do the thing that you ask it to do, but it will hash to a completely different value and all the locations of all the subroutines will be in different places. So you can't use return operated, uh, or return operation, um, What's, what's, what's ROP? Return Operation Programming. So, um, yeah, there are a couple different things we use, but yes, that was a very sophisticated piece of code, SCADA uh, uh, control code that we went ahead and ported to the unikernel. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Long, long answer to a very short question. I apologize. Quick, another quick question. Sure. Um, when they're using the Linux kernel, are they basically replacing a net the init uh, task with um, whatever they want as a user program? That's it, exactly. Your, your application becomes the init. Yep. That's what I did in about 1985. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure that you would surprise a lot of people if they were to, to realize that init is just really the first program that's the process one that runs. You know. But you could substitute anything you wanted to for, uh, for init. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I guess if there are no more questions, then thank you very much. Thank you. Now, oh, you already clapped. You already clapped. Hold on. <laughs>